to be here. Uh, this is one of the highlights uh, of my year. Uh, every year I've been coming here for, uh, I don't know, four or five years now and I hope to be, do so in the foreseeable future uh, because uh, I get to meet people from all over the world and to learn a lot from them and also to renew uh, acquaintances with my colleagues working in uh, in similar areas, in my areas of interest. My wife jokes, she says, okay, you're going now, this is the time you go and meet your friends. Uh, and I say, yeah, you go and play with your friends. So <laughs> I get permission to come for four or five days out of the week, come and, come and spend it with you um, in this beautiful place and of great historical significance for Austrian economics and for lovers of liberty in, in particular. Uh, the more astute of you will have noticed that, uh, or will have uh, realized that although uh, my professional association is with the University of Texas at Dallas, uh, I probably didn't grow up in Texas. Oh, really? Yeah, as I say, the more astute of you. Uh, the truth of the matter is I, uh, I grew up, uh, was born in, and grew up in Johannesburg, South Africa, and uh, I came to uh, the University of Chicago in 1972 where I stayed for three years, three and a half years and then went back to South Africa to uh, uh, enjoy some of the benefits, some of the newly realized benefits of the extended family uh, where our second child was born and then uh, left in uh, December 31st, 1978 for, for Dallas, Texas where we have lived ever since. So I've spent most of my life uh, living in Texas uh, and uh, yet somehow have uh, never managed to acquire the accent. Although my friends in the old country tell me that I speak like an American and uh, when, I, uh, when I listen to my tapes uh, I do hear a few sort of defensive um, intonations that I need, to, uh, I need to sometimes say words in a particular way in order to be understood. But if there's anything that you don't understand, please stop me, raise your hand, and I will uh, I'll try and articulate for you. But we have in this room people with many different accents, so I'll assume that mine is not, not particularly strange. Um, as I say, I grew up in South Africa. That is where in my undergraduate training I met Ludwig Lachmann, who, uh, who was a German economist, uh, but who had met Mises in, in uh, Geneva and then worked with Hayek at the London School of Economics and came to South Africa, Johannesburg in 1950 and uh, I met him uh, in, I guess 1966 and did all my undergraduate economics in one way or another with him and was very much affected by his thinking and by him, his personality. Uh, probably hardly a day goes by when uh, in my professional work when I don't uh, think of him in one way or another. And uh, you will see that his work is is mentioned in what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Austrian theory of capital and interest. Uh, and I need to uh, just uh, say a little bit about what this is. Uh, I know that, uh, that in this audience we probably have people at different levels of preparation and background. So uh, just some of you will, uh, will know what I, much more about what I have to say than others. I'll assume that you know next to nothing. Um, the uh, capital theory refers, of course, to the theory of capital where we mean by capital physical means of production. So this building, this computer, um, raw materials, um, uh, land, I guess, in, in, a, in, a, in a sense improved land, uh, anything that is used in the production process, physical item that is used in the, in the production process, is uh, thought of as capital. Now financial capital is part of the process as well but it's a particular, a special part that uh, I guess uh, you'll talk about in other, in other contexts in the course of the seminar. My concern is with physical capital and, and so I, I need to state this because uh, in, in popular conversation and, uh, and even among economists sometimes when they talk about capital, for example venture capital, capital necessary for production, they're really referring to financial capital, but now we're talking about the production process, the capital structure, we're talking about physical, physical things. And uh, capital theory, as it turns out, uh, has uh, 
been somewhat obscured in the past couple of generations, I guess, uh, insofar as it's uh, since the Keynesian revolution and since the uh, neoclassical uh, ascendancy in microeconomics, the whole subject of capital, the, the theme of capital as a separate subject, has been ignored. Um, if they've studied it at all, they've studied it in the context of financial capital. Some of what we'll talk about today is barely reflected in the field of finance, and I'll, I'll mention that. But uh, uh, for better or for worse, and I will try and convince you that it's for worse, the, um, the mainstream in economics has not thought it necessary to, uh, or relevant to study the kinds of things that I'm going to be talking about. Um, as Steve mentioned my book, uh, I, 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 do, I do talk about this a little bit in the book, uh, and uh, unfortunately the book is out of print, uh, but maybe if you all write to the publishers, to the publisher we can, we can get a movement going to bring it back. Uh, just kidding. Uh, I have a couple of articles uh, on, on, um, on this subject matter. This, oh, whoops, excuse me figure out how to point this. This uh, link, uh, this uh, PowerPoint presentation I think will be made available to you by fee, but if not I'll put a link on my website so that you can get it. This, there's a link, uh, the Capital Idea links to my, an article where I talk about some of the things that we're going to be talking about in today's, uh, in today's lecture. So, um, yeah, the, for the mainstream Capital theory was not seen to be relevant because, basically because of their methodology, because of the methods that they use in the, in the interest of generating hypotheses, they thought it uh, okay to be able to just assume that capital is that thing, that homogeneous entity called K that they put into their production functions. Uh, but for Austrians, uh, and I think actually for doing good economics and more and more in the management field, uh, entrepreneurial studies, you've just listened to a, a lecture from the master on uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, more and more interest in entrepreneurial studies now, two, three, four, five journals in the management field in which uh, some of this material is being, is being studied seriously and extended. So uh, for different reasons, but I can reaffirm what uh, Professor Horwitz said last night, that uh, if, uh, fortunately or unfortunately this has been somewhat of a good time for Austrian economics uh, in many different ways, uh, at, least, at least in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the recent, looking back at the recent past, this is a period of interest in Austrian economics uh, greater than I have known uh, during my lifetime. Um, So I'm going to tell you a story in two parts. Uh, the first part is about capital theory and the second part is about interest. And uh, given the time available, I probably will have very little to say about interest. But enough, hopefully, to pique your interest, no pun intended. Uh, enough to be able to get you to, uh, to uh, understand uh, the Austrian approach to interest, even if you don't have all the details or the backup uh, justifying that particular approach. Uh, the theory of capital, though, uh, in order to do that, I have to give you a little bit of the history of thought, actually a lot of the history of thought. I think you probably find that, uh, that a lot of Austrian economists pay attention to history and to the history of thought, much more so than the, than the standard fare that you get in economics departments. Uh, and uh, I, 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 um, I, you know, I, I, perhaps I don't have to justify that, but in any case, to motivate that, let me put it that way, uh, it, it's impossible to understand capital theory unless you sort of understand the mental context, the mindset of the developers of the theory of Austrian capital theory and, so, and, and how it fits in with the development of economics as a whole. Um, I tell you that, uh, that uh, capital theory, from an Austrian perspective, is the basis of just about everything else that follows. So, uh, if I were less modest than I am, or less uh, 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 forthright than I am, I might say that this is the most important lecture that you will have. Because you have to know something about capital theory if you're going to go on and talk about monetary theory, if you're going to go on and talk about 
other aspects, maybe time in economics and all, all these other things that are going to follow after me, to some extent there's, there's a sense in putting me at this place in the program because capital theory provides the foundations of everything else that you do, certainly in Austrian economics, but I would say economics in general. It's, it may be part of the fact that being trained in Austrian economics, I'm like a, a practitioner with a hammer and everything I see looks like a nail. Uh, but uh, uh, I, think, I think that's part of it because I naturally think of the world through the lenses that I've developed, the intellectual lenses that I've developed. But, but I think that besides that, there is some independent, if you like, truth to that statement and I'll leave you to be the judge of that. So, uh, th I, th I think uh, um, we're justified in taking a broad uh, perspective and looking at the history. And I'll begin by looking at the history of uh, Austrian capital theory through Austrian economics, and then I'll, in a moment I'll cast a slightly wider net. Now, of course, it all starts with Karl Menger in 1871 in Principles of Economics. And you probably have heard about that and will hear some more about it. Uh, wonderful little book that is so pregnant with implications that it almost defies the imagination. Uh, and of course it gave rise to a whole school of thought. Uh, and most uh, particularly his immediate disciples at the University of Vienna, Eugene von Bombarvec. Uh, I apologize to any German speakers in the audience. Uh, apparently, uh, as I recall from Lachmann, it's pronounced Bombarvec. But uh, I am so used to mispronouncing it that uh, I, I don't know if I can change at this stage of my life. Forgive me. The, um, the, his brother-in-law and colleague at the University of v Vienna, uh, Friedrich von Wiese, who uh, is um, a lesser known Austrian but was very influential on Friedrich Hayek, his teacher. Uh, Bombarvec was really an inspiration for Mises. And, uh, of course, Hayek uh, draws from all of these uh, masters, these, these predecessors. And at each point, we get uh, contributions to the development of capital theory that I'm going to be talking about. And which brings us uh, sort of to Hayek and beyond, we get the modern period. to substantive contribution to, Austrian, to the development of Austrian capital theory with Ludwig Lachmann and to some extent also Israel Kirzner. And then we get what I called current applications. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, some time in the future somebody uh, with esoteric interests enough to be looking back at this will say that uh, someone took uh, or Lachmann's theory and did it in this or that way. But uh, we should just be content at this stage to say that we're applying these insights to, um, uh, to, to, to current uh, situations. Uh, just to give you an idea as of what I said a moment ago, of course, uh, you will hear from Roger Garrison about macroeconomics. Uh, uh, understanding capital theory will help there. Steve Horowitz and I have a uh, brilliant article in the uh, Review of Austrian Economics on, uh, on uh, some application of this capital theory to, uh, to the family, to the economics of the family. Uh, it's quite long and convoluted, but uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in management field, as, as Steve mentioned, and, and, and many other places. Now, in terms of the wider connection, of course, everything begins with Adam Smith, right? Not really, but... Uh, but that's where we usually start our stories. Uh, of course, there was economics before Adam Smith, and maybe every idea that is in the Wealth of Nations might have a predecessor somewhere, but uh, he was just such a genius in pulling things together and expressing them in an accessible way, and certainly his uh, uh, prominence uh, suggests that we start with him, and also the date at which he published the, the Wealth of Nations, right? Right? Um, so, with the uh, publication of the Wealth of Nations, we get, we get really, uh, I guess the thing to say is, uh, Karl Menger uh, got a lot of his inspiration from Smith. 
It is true that if you read Menger's Principles of Economics, you'll see that he criticizes Smith, sometimes quite vigorously. But it's also true that, uh, that he and German language economics in general uh, received most of their inspiration from Smith, from his general ideas and from his general approach to markets. And I'm going to try and uh, underline that. One of the things I'm going to be doing in a moment is, is giving you a lot of quotations from the works of these individuals. Some of them I may be able to read at greater length. And uh, I hope uh, you will see that they're relevant to, what I, to the story of the, de of the development of capital theory. Um, Adam Smith uh, uh, begins it. His disciple, David Ricardo, 30 years later in England, yeah, Smith, is, of course, is in Scotland. He, uh, he's very much an admirer of Smith, but he um, embarks on a turn which, uh, which some of uh, the historians have called the Ricardian turn uh, that really takes us in a different direction from the direction, if, from the direction of, uh, of Austrian economics. If you, um, in retrospect, if you're reconstructing sort of the history, the development of the history of thought, although at the time they didn't know it, you would have to say that, the, the, that the, the parting of the ways occurs with Ricardo. Uh, because Ricardo has a particular system that results in the development of both neoclassical economics, once the marginal revolution occurs in 1870, and also, of course, Marxism. Marx was a Ricardian. And, and all of the socialists who really use the idea of the labor theory of value are Ricardians. They really get their ideas, their system, from Ricardo. Ricardo was a good economist. He, we owe a lot to him. Uh, but there were two, two main problems, two fateful errors, if you like, from the perspective of Austrian economics that he made. And one was in terms of valuation in terms of what I will call later the cost of production valuation. And the other is, is a lesser known and uh, perhaps not quite as important, but certainly important in the, uh, for example, in the field of management, is his rent theory. His rent theory is widely known and admired, and I think in a sense shouldn't be, shouldn't be admired. It may be widely known, but uh, for reasons that I will try and explain. Uh, but but uh, uh, so Ricardo gives rise to these two developments, and in particular, what we get is the neoclassicals. You know, Marxism runs its course after uh, I don't know what uh, tens of millions of deaths and hundreds of millions of people suffering in, in, in deprivation and oppression. The power of ideas is enormous, and uh, in the West we get the development of neoclassical economics. <coughs> but Menger owes almost nothing to Ricardo, well truly owes nothing to Ricardo, and a whole lot to Smith, so it's a sort of the uh, uh, Austrians bypassing the Ricardian development, but only realizing it, looking back we realize what's happened. And that's uh, some of what I do in that article called The Capital Idea. Um, I should mention also two other names that are important in the development of capital theory. One of course is Joseph Schumpeter, who was an Austrian economist in the sense that he was Austrian and he was an economist. Uh, but uh, his status as an Austrian economist in the, in the usual sense is uh, controversial. Uh, he certainly was sympathetic to the Austrians and in recent years uh, some of the work that I've done and some colleagues uh, have made us realize that his ideas were instrumental development of the capital theory of both Hayek and Luffman. Actually, in capital theory, Schumpeter turns out to be a very important, uh, very important player. He certainly was a remarkable individual and uh, has done work that has endured. Uh, I think probably we'd be better uh, justified in putting him in his own school uh, rather than Austrian economist. He's a Schumpeterian economist, as there are many Schumpeterian economists around. But he does definitely has something to offer the Austrians and, and to, to many different branches of inquiry, uh, business and economic inquiry. And so he needs to be mentioned. And then John Hicks, a uh, totally different uh, type of uh, thinker, but one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century, greatest economists of the 20th century, one of the early Nobel Prize winners. Hicks 
was a um, was an economist's economist. He was somebody who was able to sort of straddle the fences to try and look critically but fairly at different uh, different perspectives and to to provide a way of relating them that was unique and very very insightful. He wrote three major works with capital in its title. Uh, they were all definitive, particularly the first capital and uh, value and capital, which really was, uh, you know, instrumental in establishing a lot of the bases for neoclassical economics. Uh, a book, Capital and Growth, which was really, you know, uh, really uh, contributed an enormous amount to growth theory. And his final book, which is not that widely read and not that well known, uh, Capital and Time. And he says, a neo-Austrian approach. And perhaps that neo-Austrian approach is not so uh, descriptive, uh, but it's a very interesting book, and I've reviewed that, and I think the article is available. Yeah, the article is available on my website. I have a link to it if you're interested. But I think Hicks definitely deserves to be mentioned because Hicks was very sensitive to the Austrians. He had the greatest admiration for the Austrians, in spite of being a giant among non-Austrians. And he, uh, in particular, had a close relationship intellectually with Ludwig Lachmann. And uh, Capital and Time is written with one eye to Lachmann. How do I know this? I know this because Hicks said so. And I quote I the source for that in that article. So those are the main players in our little drama. And we should then begin the story. Um, Adam Smith has a, a theory of capital. Uh, you know, he has uh, this uh, uh, fairly long book, in, in, uh, divided into, into many parts. Uh, but I'm just going to select one quote to sort of give you a sense uh, of, of basically how, we, how the classicals thought about capital. He says, the annual product of the land and labor of any nation can be increased in its value by no other measure but by increasing either the number of its productive laborers or the productive powers of those laborers who had, who had been before employed. The number of productive laborers, it is evident, can never be much increased but in consequence of an increase in capital or of the funds destined for maintaining them. The productive powers of the same number of laborers cannot be increased but in consequence, meaning only in consequence, either of some addition an improvement to those machines and instruments which f facilitate and abridge labor, meaning economize on labor, or of a more proper division and distribution of employment. In either case, the additional capital is almost always required, almost always required. It is by means of an additional capital only that the undertaker of any work can either provide his workmen with better machinery or make a more proper distribution of employment among them. It's just one paragraph, but um, it contains so many different ideas uh, that we could probably spend the rest of the time I have here just talking about this paragraph, which we perhaps shouldn't do. Um, but let's try and sort of distill some of the... Uh, some of the things that he says. According to Smith, he says savings is necessary for the achievement of economic growth. This is to sort of translate what he's saying. We say, you've got workers who are working and you want to increase their productivity. You want to increase their average product, to put it in, 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 uh, in modern terminology. How can you do that? He says, the only way you can do that is to give them more to work with. And also maybe you feed them better. You see? And where does that come from? Well, it comes from not consuming everything that you've produced. He's thinking primarily of an agricultural environment in which you're producing what it was, it's called in the literature a corn economy. So you're producing corn in the American sense, and some of it uh, you plant, and some of it you put away in a storehouse to feed the people who are working, and some of it you eat. So what you don't eat, you save, and in a sense, what, the more you save, the, the more you have available to feed the people who are working and maybe the more you have available to sort of augment, I suppose by, uh, by selling it, 
to, to get machinery with which you can feed them. But he doesn't talk much about the machinery at this point. He's just talking about, the, as he called it, the capitals that are made available to, uh, to, to uh, employment. And he says, and it's necessary. If you want to achieve any kind of economic growth, you have to have savings. This is, becomes very important, of course, in the Keynesian revolution. And when you have people like... Um, when you have some modern personalities telling us that we're saving too much and we ought to be spending more, you know, you begin to think, well, what, how, isn't there a contradiction here somewhere? You know, if saving is necessary for economic growth, but our politicians and national economists are telling us that we shouldn't be saving so much that we need to be spending, well, where are we going to get economic growth from? You know, something that, uh, that I, I guess uh, you will return to in the course of the seminar. He says, Smith, the earning of profit I'm, I'm trying to synchronize here. The earning of profit is consequent not simply upon the accumulation of capital, but significantly also upon the fruits of the division of labor. Very, very important. This is something that is sometimes missed in the uh, neoclassical formulations. You see, capital has to be organized. It's like um, it has to be in the form in which it can be combined with labor in order to produce something valuable. If you give people something that they have no idea how to use, well, it will have a zero value. Uh, in, a, in a corn economy, yes, you can, uh, corn is food, or if, uh, if it's a kind of a fungible food item, well, then it doesn't matter. It's already available in a, what they call a subsistence fund in order to be able to use for the workers to sustain them while they're working. Because as you understand, from production. The fruits of production come after the production process has been initiated. So there is sort of a, a time period uh, leading up to during the time that people are working they have to be sustained with the product that they will ultimately produce. So that has to be advanced to them and that's where the capitalist comes in by providing that fund necessary to sustain them. That's a classical way of thinking about it. So in modern terms, we might say capital accumulation, technical progress, and economic organization are all tied together. You see, you have, to, you have to have the saving, then it has to be in the form in which it can sustain labor that is organized for production. And in the neoclassical framework, there's no discussion of organization. There's really not much discussion in Austrian economics either, at least up until recently. And maybe some economists, as I'll suggest, you think that maybe that's beyond the scope of economics. But surely that's part of the production process, isn't it? I mean, organization, which by another name we call management or, or, uh, or uh, coordination or some other uh, function, is absolutely crucial uh, to uh, producing an output. You have to have people in the right place making the right decisions at the right time. And, uh, and, 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 and if, you, if you do that judiciously, if you do that cleverly, you have a proper, as Adam Smith might have said, a proper division of labor. So capital has to be suitable to the proper division of labor, economic organization. And, so, and, and in Smith's world, absolutely the division of labor, we know that from his chapter 5, I believe it is, that the division of labor is intricately, inseparably connected to the idea of technological change, technical progress. He has his three reasons for how uh, the division of labor leads to innovation. And uh, frequently, if, and perhaps most often, it is the workman himself who is discovering new ways of, new and better ways of doing things. So this is more than implicit in Smith. It's, it's absolutely clear that, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, these, these things are tied together. The availability of capital <clears throat> so capital accumulation, technical progress and economic organization are tied together. The availability of capital is necessary though apparently not sufficient. Remember he says almost always. So he said you know sometimes you can find a um, a free lunch. <laughs> there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Well, sometimes maybe you stumble upon a new resource that you, that you didn't know existed or something like that. But it, almost always, the only way that you get economic growth is through savings. And, uh, and so this uh, capital is necessary for the adoption of new and more productive uh, uh, methods of production. 
There's a kind of a diminishing returns. I don't recall if that's in that uh, paragraph or not. But in Smith, he says that this, uh, there's a limit to this. You know, you can't, uh, every unit of saving doesn't bring the same increase in productivity. Uh, there's a kind of a diminishing returns. But it's a little bit li different from the diminishing returns that you get uh, from your standard production function type reasoning. Or those of you who, who haven't had much economics, the idea of diminishing returns when you apply a variable uh, input, a variable factor to something that's fixed, like you're adding workers to a farm. Uh, and as you add more and more workers, uh, you add to, to the total product, but the additions, the, the, the amount that you add goes down with each addition and eventually is, goes down to zero. For else, you would be able to produce uh, enough food for the whole world, right? So diminishing returns, any student of economics knows what that is, diminishing marginal productivity. Adam Smith is talking about not exactly that. He's talking about something a little different because the accumulation of savings and capital that's coming along here is, is accompanied by changes in technology. We find, uh, we find uh, almost none of this in the traditional liter literature with a few exceptions, one being uh, a work by Nicholas Calder from the London School of Economics in the 1930s where he talked about a production function incorporating technological change. It's really a, a, a heroic attempt to try and put a round peg into a square hole. But it, at least, it, at least it, uh, it, it, it shows recognition of the problem. So Smith is talking about you know, uh, getting better ways of doing things as well as getting more of it. And there's uh, diminishing returns to that as well, because he says, you know, there's only so much that can be discovered with any period of time, with any given ambit, with any particular environment. So I say, this is clearly not in the form of a declining rate of return to investment in a given mode of production, but rather refers to the eventual possible exhaustion of investment opportunities for extending the division of labor. That is for discovery and introduction of new and improved methods of production. Now, I, that brings us to David Ricardo, whom I said uh, took us down a, uh, a different path. And uh, his world is different, is the first thing that you need to understand. Smith talks about machinery and he talks about capital in the... Uh, in the sense of durable equipment, uh, but he's a little uh, fuzzy about it. He has a section in his uh, growth theory where he's talking about productive and unproductive labor. For him, the productive sector is sort of agricultural, and he's in a world where mostly most of the things that are done are agricultural. Uh, David Ricardo is sort of uh, uh, on the cusp of the Industrial Revolution, and he's looking at a very different world, and he's asking very different questions, and it's important to know that. Because, I, I mean, hardly anything could be more important in the history of economic thought to explain why we do what we do now. Uh, as a, well, sort of why, we, why, we, why we're doing the Ricardian agenda rather than the Smith agenda. Ricardo's agen agenda, indeed, was very different because his world was different. For one thing, he's, uh, he's in a world where there's a lot of fixed equipment. There's a lot of physical equipment. As I say, the Industrial Revolution is coming along. And he's, uh, and he's asking the question, well, as it tells us, savings is necessary and, uh, and we have to accumulate this, but how is it that, uh, what do we do with machinery? And uh, we will see that he really didn't answer that question in a satisfactory way. What do we do with what we will later realize is heterogeneous capital items? Capital items that are not commensurate with one another. You know, you can't add a uh, printing press to a, uh, a, uh, a buzz saw or whatever and say we have two, two pieces of capital. It doesn't make sense. You have to somehow reduce them to a, a commensurate dimension. Uh, is it money? Is it the amount of labor that it takes to produce it? Or what is it? Well, Ricardo tried to answer that question because he needed to. And why did he need to? Because he was answering a different question. Smith's question was, what was Smith's question? An inquiry into the uh, causes and nature of the wealth of nations. What's his question? Right. What makes a nation rich? Right. Why are some, yeah. What are the causes and nature, of, the nature of the wealth of nations? So he had to talk about what is wealth. Didn't get it quite right. But the causes, maybe, is what he's most well known for. The division of labor, the accumulation of capital, and the right institutions. 
right? You're going to hear a lot about that, about institutions. In other words, private property, contracts, the ability to trade, to truck and barter, and so on. He understood this very, very well. Ricardo's not asking that question. Maybe Ricardo thinks, okay, Smith provided us with that answer. He's asking a different question. He says, what are the laws of motion of industrialized economies? It says it may be an unfortunate way of proposing the question because of the laws of motion. Later on, you come to Mises, says, there are no laws of motion. We're dealing with social sciences, not physical sciences. There are no constants. Of course, Marx had, they say Marx was a Ricardian because Marx talks about the forces or processes in history as though they are inexorable. You know, the, 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 the notion of the individual gets suppressed an individual choice. So Ricardo is asking, he's, particular concern, he's particularly concerned with, with uh, certain kinds of laws, in the laws of accumulation and the laws of progress towards what he called a stationary state. So, and the answer he gives is very instructive. He's much uh, influenced by people like Thomas Malthus, who was a colleague and a friend, and, uh, and others who are looking around and they're trying to figure out what to make of this new world, of this new, uh, you know, free market industrializing world, which is bringing a whole new class of people, the bourgeoisie, the, the, the new business people, who have their own political agenda and power, and uh, a, a changing that the, the, the landed aristocracy, the landholders, are diminishing in number and power while the business people are increasing in number and power. And uh, Ricardo is very much influenced by this and by the fact that Britain is also in a war with France, with Napoleon, and a blockade is being threatened in which it's going to be difficult for England to import the, 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 the food and the raw materials that it needs to continue its production. So all of these things are in his mind and he figures, well, how, how does a nation proceed over time? And the way he, proceed, the way he answers a question is he divides, he establishes categories. He thinks of it as a sort of an input-output system. We have a certain things that we want to produce and we have certain categories of inputs that we use to produce them. And it's crucial to realize that in Ricardo, he identifies those categories with classes. Something that we, to some extent, take for granted in a way that, that perhaps even when it's pointed out to us, we don't see the significance of it. So, I mean social classes. So he says, on the one, uh, sort of at the bottom of the pyramid, you've got labor. What are they? That's the workers. So labor, what about them? Well, they earn wages, okay. Well, what happens to their wages over time? And the answer that he gives is nothing. Um, sorry, just what, need to, I tend to get carried away, so I need to time myself. What happens to the wages? What happens to their wages? Nothing. They are sort of uh, fixed at what is called the level of subsistence. Why? Because according to Thomas Malthus, human beings behave like rabbits. That is to say, they have babies up to the point of survival. That there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing that will constrain them except want of, of sustenance. So, if wages tend to rise, more, more babies will survive. More births and more of them will survive. And over time, more of them will enter the labor force, increasing the supply of labor. And we may think that's a very long-term process, but you have to remember in this world it doesn't take but uh, 12 years uh, to get somebody from birth into the labor force, maybe even younger than that. And of course, some of it is family work and so on. So, so uh, increasing population brings decrease in wages. <coughs> decrease in wages <coughs> excuse me, brings a decrease in population. So because of Malthus's iron law of wages, if you like, labor is imprisoned at the subsistence level. Now what about the capitalists? They're the new class. Capital is the other category of production and capital is associated with the capitalists. And who are these guys? These are the guys who have the money to advance the means of production to the, to the workers in order to get the final product produced. And these guys are in vigorous, you might say, cutthroat competition with one another. And what they do is they compete so vigorously that they compete away all profits. 
so that the rate of profit is driven to zero in the long run. And it's a very short step in Ricardo from an assertion of a long run tendency to a de facto state of affairs. It's like the, the, we begin with Ricardo to become habituated to thinking about long run tendencies as sort of parameters in the world. So there's the profits, they're earned, the capitalists are earning profits, but the rate of profit is driven to zero. So you might say in a neoclassical framework, they're earning only enough to cover the cost of capital, normal profits if you like. And then who's left? Well, who's left are the landowners, and this is where he gets his theory of rent. The landowners, they own a resource that is absolutely fixed in number, in amount, in quantity. So they have an increasing demand as the society accumulates capital for a fixed resource. And so the, the difference between the price, if you like, and the amount paid to rent or to farm or to use the, the land increases. And he, that's Ricardo's theory of rent. Their earnings, their rental earnings, go up un, in an unlimited way. So the only people sort of who make out from this process are the landholders. The capitalists compete themselves into the ground and the workers are imprisoned in the subsistence at the level of subsistence. It's not a particularly innovating or inspiring uh, uh, way of looking at the world. Um, now, you see, in order for Ricardo's theory to make sense, notice that he talks about the rate of profit. A rate of profit is, is, uh, is computed on the basis of a uh, sort of a flow of earnings on a stock of capital, right? R over K or something, I over K. Now what is that K? In order to be able to talk sensibly, sensibly about the rate of profit, you have to have a way of measuring capital. You have to have a way more, more uh, uh, accurately of quantifying capital. So we begin with Ricardo to this uh, idea of quantification. Quantification of capital, and in general, a shift towards a more mechanical way of looking at things in economics as a whole. Um, the way he does it, he says, you know, if you think about it essentially, fixed capital is really circulating capital that's only circulating more slowly. There's an essential truth, there's an essence of truth in that, I suppose. You could say this is what the accountant tries to do when he or she tries to uh, estimate how much of a particular piece of fixed equipment is used up in any given period, is depreciated, and we provide a fund for depreciation that will ultimately accumulate to the amount necessary to replace the equipment. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of what Ricardo has in mind, but if you know anything about accounting, you know that it's not easy, and one person's estimate is not going to be the same as any other's. And to jump from that simply to the assumption that, uh, that, okay, well now we know that it's really just circulating capital in another guise, so we don't have to worry about the fact that these things are visually or physically different, is, uh, is, is a big step. In particular, the thing that you find in Ricardo is there is no question about how you get to the long run. This is an assumption of equilibrium, that is to say. Equilibrium in the later Hayekian sense in that there are no errors made. Because think about it like this. He says that the capitalists are competing with one another and they're accumulating capital and they're driving down the rate of profit and, uh, and ultimately they will drive it down to zero. Well, what happened to technological change? What happened to, to innovations along the way? I mean, Ricardo was wrong. Ricardo and Malthus were wrong for a number of reasons. They were wrong about human beings behaving like rabbits. And they were wrong about the resources in the world being, being homogeneous and fixed in amount, of course. But that hasn't stopped a lot of people who are simply, really, look around, modern-day Ricardian Malthusists. Malthusists. Uh, modern day environmentalists uh, uh, may be innocent of this, uh, of this development but have certainly independently uh, rediscovered some of these ideas. Uh, so uh, there is a particular mindset, it's a static mindset. The Ricardian mind is a static mindset and in, in, in such a world there, is, there are no mistakes. You know, he doesn't ask, well, what happens uh, along the way to long run equilibrium? That these, uh, how do these, these accumulators of capital know where to put it and in what form? And do they make mistakes? 
And are they ever pleasantly surprised? There's no dynamic in this system. It just inexorably makes its way towards a zero rate of profit, a long run equilibrium. And also, he uses a device that becomes, uh, uh, that becomes incredibly uh, uh, influential, and that is, he says, if we want to uh, quantify capital, we can do so by adding up the amount of labor that goes in to produce it. So we can really reduce everything to labor, right? Because ultimately, and the Austrians wouldn't disagree, if you go back, regress far enough back, you realize that what we inherited on the earth were what, what, uh, what Bombarvek called the originary factors of production. We inherited the land around us and whatever nature gave us and our own bodies and minds. And uh, from that we begin to establish uh, capital. So Robinson Crusoe is in some sense on a desert island, marooned, is thrown back into a kind of a state of nature, an original state of nature, and he builds a, a, a fishing net. That fishing net is a capital good for him. But it's built with the, uh, with his, with the labor of his own hands and with the, what he finds in nature. So in, a, in some sense you can reduce everything to labor. It's either today's labor or yesterday's labor. And that's, that particular approach is called the uh, labor theory of value. And uh, the, 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 there's so many things wrong with it, but a couple that would have occurred to you is, number one, you know, how do you value the labor? It just really pushes the problem one step back. You don't know, so you want to add a, a printing press to a buzz saw, so you have to get the value of the printing press and the buzz saw to see, you know, how do you put the, the two things together? We say, well, how much labor did it take to produce each and then add that together? The amount of labor they eat together with so many labor hours. Or you look at two production processes, one, <coughs> um, one man working for 10 days or two men working for five days, is worth the same. But doesn't that assume that the labor that goes into it is homogeneous? That you can sort of add the labor one to the other? Can you just add human bodies and assume that they are the same? If not, how are you going to put a dollar value on them? And how are you going to evaluate all the dead labor that went into machinery? A superficial reading of Marx, by the way, <coughs> is to say that uh, everything that we see in the world was produced by labor because uh, Marx adopts Ricardo's categorization, land, labor, capital, and, and, and translates that into the different classes in society. But well, of course, it doesn't take very long where you, they, 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 are not, they don't correspond. Everybody in America today, everybody living and working in, in America today is a capitalist. There may be some workers among them, but those workers are also capitalists, right? Because they have a pension fund in which, in which they have shares in capital production. <coughs> so, uh, lost my train of thought there. Ricardo, <laughs> what was I asking? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Marx, yeah. That in a sense, everything is, thank you, everything that is produced by, uh, is produced by labor, uh, yet the capitalists get to paid something and the landowners get paid something, so obviously labor is being exploited. How come labor doesn't, doesn't draw the whole of what it produces? How come there's the surplus there that is going to these other classes? Um, so, the one, so that's the one thing that's sort of wrong with the labor theory of value is that how do, you, how do you evaluate heterogeneous units of labor? But the other is, it assumes that value is determined by the cost of production. It assumes that the value of something is determined by the cost of the things that produced it. And it is Karl Menger who points out in the clearest possible terms later in 1870, of course, that it is exactly the other way around. And when he points it out, he refers directly to Ricardo. It says it can have, that the value of anything in, that, in any particular time can have nothing to do with the value of the, of the uh, inputs that went in to produce it. You say that that's crazy. How can that be? Well, if, they, you, of course you look at the cost of production, but you only do so with regard to making of decisions. In the sense that what it cost you to produce something in the past, it may carry over into the future. But... But cost of production is historical cost. It is irrelevant from an economic point of view. More, more importantly, the value of anything is determined by what it can produce, not the other way around. 
the value of anything is determined by the value of what it produces. In other words, the value that consumers put on the thing that is produced. It's not easy, it's not difficult to prove that. What would somebody be paid whose only skill enables them to do something that nobody wants? That nobody values? How much would they be paid? Or alternatively, how much could somebody ask whose only skill or whose available skill was able to produce something that somebody valued very highly, that maybe was essential to their very livelihoods? Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't... I, okay, I take your point. It doesn't mean to say that, you know, that the market evaluates things in the way that we in some independent scale of valuations might understand. But it is true that things are valued in the market by the value of the things that people produce. Now, people in valuing that way may be mistaken. But there's no getting around the fact that value comes from the output to the input and not the other way around. <clears throat> so, that's a major, a major problem in Ricardian theory. Excuse me. <coughs> and um, and uh, it, it, the labor theory of value is one, is one kind of cost of production valuation. And uh, it, it's, it's abandoned once in 1871, Menger, Walras, and, and William Stanley Jevons discover the idea of the margin, the marginless revolution, and the subject subjectivity of value. Uh, but it's, it's in its place, the neoclassical economists put, uh, a, a establish, if you like, a, a, um, an equivalent way to, uh, to, con to continue to use equilibrium, and that is the assumption of equilibrium. Uh, and we'll see that in a moment. As I say here, this is a reflection of the materi materialist fallacy, partially banished by the marginalist revolution. The labor was replaced by equilibrium value, what, uh, what the development in particular of general equilibrium. <coughs> now, Karl Menger, as I say, owes much to Adam Smith, uh, but uh, nothing. There is, uh, what, what, what Menger does, in Menger, in that little book, there is a fully articulated, very, rather short, but fully articulated theory of capital that is really the Austrian theory of capital in all of its essentials. Uh, you might say that that is the kernel and all of the rest is commentary and extension. Uh, and there he, he talks about as a time structure. This is, is, this is uh, implicit in Adam Smith in, in some of the uh, ideas that we looked at earlier that I quoted from that paragraph. It's implicit in Smith, but it's made very explicit in Menger. Menger talks about a structure of production. So there's a time structure to the production process. And he identifies, perhaps somewhat uh, confusingly, it's been confusing to students of the generations, uh, goods of higher and lower order. So that the first goods are consumption goods and higher order goods are production goods going further and further back in the process. So it sort of has a metaphor of a production process as proceeding sequentially in time. And of course we know that, uh, that uh, maybe production processes in general don't proceed that way, but uh, it doesn't really matter. The point is that time is involved in a very essential way and it, it, it behooves us to begin thinking about as a sequential process and then we can begin to understand more complex processes. He says also the, uh, the uh, earlier that one intervenes in nature is the way he thinks about it again. Uh, this is where Bombardier gets his idea about the originary factors of production is that Menger talks about what we inherit from nature and, and he says if, uh, human beings are planning their production and the earlier they start and Crusoe uh, thinks about building a uh, fishing net and uh, he can take, you know, three days to build a nice one but five days to, to build a really nice one, uh, then he's going to be more productive if he takes more time. That is to say, the advance, the earlier the process begins in relation to the use of the, pro of the, of the, of the particular uh, production instrument, the better it will be. So he says, by making progress in the employment of goods of higher orders for the satisfaction of their needs, economizing men 
can assuredly increase the consumption goods available to them according but only on condition that they lengthen the periods of time over which their activity is to extend in the same degree that they progress to goods of higher order. <clears throat> so production is the result of human planning, right? It's very clear. There can be, no, there can be errors in human capital. <coughs> Excuse me. There can be errors in human planning. Obviously, human beings are fallible. But the market tends to correct such errors. And there's no uh, continual equilibrium like we have to have in, in the case of Ricardo. Uh, and that we sort of take over. Equilibrium is in the sense not so much of rational action like it is in the, in the Chicago school. But in the, more, in the broader neoclassical paradigm, general equilibrium in particular, where, where uh, uh, equilibrium means no mistakes. It means that people uh, have the same correct expectations that tend to be it's a Hayekian equilibrium. So the market tends to correct such errors, but there's no continual equilibrium. There's a continual groping of the structure of production towards the changing structure of consumption. <coughs> it's important to underline Menger's insights. If you adopt his perspective, you cannot lose sight of the variety of goods and services and individual activities and choices. You see heterogeneity, you see difference, you see diversity. There is no suggestion of a uniform rate of profit at any point in time, yet there's an inescapable order within the variety provided by our understanding of the purposes of individuals. So there's no equilibrium in the sense in which I mentioned, yet if people make sense of it, other humans, Martians maybe not, but other humans can look and see what's going on and they say, yes, I understand that. Why do they understand that? Because they're humans and they can engage in introspective, uh, in subjective introspection, intersubjective introspection, <laughs> if you like. They can think about what these people's purposes are and therefore these, this machinery and this network, this structure makes sense. The process of transforming goods of higher order into goods of lower order must always be planned and conducted with some economic purpose in view by an economizing individual. And, and, and here a very important uh, conclusion is that capital and the conscious organization of production are inextricably linked. So you talk about capital, you talk about capital accumulation, you're talking about organization of production. Eugene von von Barwerk is the most famous Austrian eco economist of all time in the sense that he's most widely known, most widely read over the 20th century, later 19th and 20th century. He, when you, uh, uh, when you uh, confront people, particularly economists, if they've heard of Austrian economics at all, most likely they've heard of von Barwerk. In, modern, in the modern world, in management world, of course, they've heard of Israel Kirzner, because of his work on uh, entrepreneurship. And so that's probably not as true as it used to be. But uh, certainly when I was a student, von Barwerk was well known, particularly in the field of growth theory, in the field of people working in, 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 in any aspect of capital. Most, most, most importantly, growth theory. He was a, a prolific uh, writer. No, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. Somebody call the guy. I, I don't have control. It's on his... Abort, abort. We need to abort an automatic update. Uh, oh, he did it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, what do we say? Uh, comic diversion? <laughs> Hello. Um... He, uh, he wrote a lot, I think is what I was saying. In particular, he wrote a three-volume work on capital and interest, three uh, tomes, three uh, big volumes. And he was, he was a visible personality. He was a minister of finance in Austria for many years, a very esteemed professor at the University of Vienna, uh, and certainly a, a, a giant intellect. And <coughs> responsible, really, for the, for the development... Uh, say popularization, but uh, um, diffusion of the ideas of Austrian capital theory among people in general. Um, so 
if, if uh, uh, economists, when I was growing up, knew anything about Austrian economics, they knew about Austrian capital theory, and that meant boom, barbrek. But what did it mean? What did it mean? Uh, well, on the one hand, <coughs> boom, barbrek really adopted Menger's uh, vision, same vision. Uh, he, whereas Menger talked about goods proceeding from first order to higher order, uh, he talked about a series of concentric circles. And uh, uh, he talked about a very important phrase, roundabout methods of production. You saw with Menger, we talked about pr uh, methods taking a longer time. For Bombardic, he, had, he, had, he uses this word, I don't know what it is in German, translated in English to roundabout, meaning more indirect, taking more time. And they yield a greater volume of consumption goods. Um, and he says, uh, he says that there are uh, advantages to a roundabout methods of production. I'm not going to have time to read uh, all of the quotes because I've wasted my time. <laughs> there are, he said, there are two concomitants of adoption of the capitalist method. One is the advantageous, the other is, is, is not. Uh, Leonard Forces of Nature. It's possible by well chosen roundabout capitalist methods to produce more and better goods. Look at that, more and better. So technological change is coming in there than would have been possible otherwise. He says, uh, one thing that can be stated with reasonable degree of certainty, this is a bold proposition, that as a general rule, a wisely selected extension of roundabout way of production does result in an increase in the magnitude of the product. Now it's just saying magnitude. It can be confidently maintained that there's no area of production which, no area of production, see, it can be confidently maintained. There's no area of production, it's not shy production, which could not materially increase the product over over the result obtainable by pre present methods. But <coughs> sacrifice is involved. You see how uh, in order to extend the, uh, to the production process to more roundabout methods, uh, you have to uh, sacrifice time. Capitalist uh, roundaboutness is productive but time consuming. It yields better consumption goods but, n but uh, not until a later time. And then again, all consumption goods which may not come into existence through the cooperation of human powers with the uh, forces of nature, originary forces, which are part of the economic character and part free natural powers, man can produce the consumption goods he desires through those elemental powers, directly or indirectly, and indirectly are called capital goods. The indirect method entails a sacrifice. But you have to put that sacrifice against the, the benefits. Now, obviously then you see Menger and you see sort of a spelling out of the basic idea. There's a lot... Uh, Bombovic wrote a lot, and some of what he wrote is uh, in apparent contradiction of what he wrote in other places. At least, you know, language is not, all language has to be interpreted, even mathematical symbols have to be interpreted, I guess. But in Bombovic, the uh, process of interpretation seems to be <coughs> somehow fraught with more difficulties than usual. Uh, for example, was Bombardwick talking, when he talked about capital accumulation, did he adopt the idea, Smith's idea, and, and implicit in Menger also, well, explicit in Menger, that capital accumulation is accompanied by technological change? Is it just adding the same things, or are we adding new and better things? Sometimes he seems to be saying the one, and sometimes he seems to be saying the other. Which means that there are many faces to Bombardwick, at least three, and as a result, we, we find him inspiration for three schools of thought. Ironically, the Marxists used some of his ideas, although he was the most articulate anti-Marxist of his time. He wrote a book called Karl Marx and the Close of His System. And certainly on the nature of interest and profit, he was uh, immaculate. He was wonderful, insightful, yet they still use his ideas in the same way as the neoclassicals do because of some of his formulations. So that Bombardwick's ideas become incorporated, becomes a short step from the idea of using time as an input into production to the connecting of time with the uh, instruments that go along with them to a modern production function. And the development of Robert Solow, for example, who, do, who pioneered growth theory in neoclassical economics, his ideas to Bombardwick, there's a direct line. And there's a whole modern school of thought, I don't know if they're so modern anymore, because um, I, don't, I haven't followed them for about 30 years, but there was a school of thought, they call themselves modern Austrian capital theory, they don't do what we do, but they, 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 they <coughs> um, develop convoluted mathematical theories in a Bombardwerkian sense. So, there are aspects of Bombardwerk that are Ricardian, and there are aspects of Bombardwerk that are Austrian, 
and neoclassical and even Marxist in a way. Not really. I, nothing that he said can be construed as pro-Marxist. But, <clears throat> but the, they use his ideas in a way that clearly he didn't intend. So, <clears throat> and one of the reasons is that in the second volume, for example, he spends a lot of time arguing with his critics about this idea of time and what does it mean and uh, how can you justify those bold assertions that we saw that he made. And, he, he, and we don't understand what you're saying, and uh, you're kind of mythologi mythologizing the whole process. And he says, no, 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 it's very concrete. In fact, I can provide you with a formula for measuring the amount of time that goes into the production of a particular process. And he called it the average period of production. Because clearly, there is no way in which uh, um, you can measure a production process by just looking at its term, you know, it's sort of when did it begin, when did it end, why? Because beginning and end are somewhat arbitrary and because the intensity of the production of different inputs at different times has to be taken into account. So he proposes a different formulation which is called the average period of production and if you read these quotes he's saying, yeah, yeah, I understand all your objections, I'm giving you this, this is a way, better way to measure it because you can take, this tells you sort of the amount of time for which on average and input is locked up in the production process. Now this is exactly similar to an idea that was rediscovered in the financial literature known as duration. In the financial literature where you have a, a, you're trying to evaluate a particular process which has a definite beginning and a definite end and you can unambiguously identify and measure and evaluate the input and the output, you can measure, uh, there's a, a, a formula that is very similar to this formula. We'll have an exam on this in the, in the uh, in the discussion group, yes. <clears throat> it, it measures the average time for which a dollar is locked up in the investment. That's what the, the idea of duration in finance does. And it's a perfectly cogent idea. But this is about labor. This is, uh, in a way, is he not being Ricardian? Going back to Ricardian, it's like uh, average time for which a unit of lab labor time is locked up in the production process is given away the farm. And this got him into a lot of trouble. Purportedly, Menger thought that it was the greatest mistake that, that any of his disciples had ever made. Uh, and, uh, and, the, uh, and, the, and, and so the question, sort of, Bumbarvik, whose Bumbarvik are we talking about? <coughs> is it a cost of production approach? Is it a general equilibrium approach? Or is it a Mengerian approach? So in my book, I talk about Mengerian rather than Bumbarvikian uh, 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 capital theory. Because the, the Mengerian approach through Bernbarvik leads to the modern Austrians, Mises, Hayek, Lachmann, Kurt, and Kersner. And I have to, uh, I have to uh, go a little bit more quickly through, through what we have left. Thank you. Um, by the time Bernbarvik gets sort of finished, and he, there's a lot of activity that's intellectual back and forth, the Austrian capital theory is quite well known, but there's not much extension going on until Hayek and then Lachmann later on. But what does happen is that the controversies that, uh, that attended Bumbarvik's work tend to return in each generation. It seems like each generation has its own capital controversy. And uh, there are a lot of them, and I mentioned them here in yellow. I don't have time uh, to go through them. Uh, to, to explain what they are. <laughs> Average period of production. Thank you. Um, but uh, one of them in Bumbarvik's own time is a discussion of the, of the APP and he has a fight with uh, J.B. Clark and then later on Hayek has a, has a, a back and forth with, um, with uh, um, Frank Knight from the University of Chicago and then later on there is the Cambridge Cambridge debate what <laughs> uh, and the different Cambridges uh, it's the Marxists against the neoclassicals and the this is but the same uh, really the same stuff and uh, both Lachman and Kersner have provided summaries of, of why the whole debate was wrong-headed because it's really a misunderstanding of capital theory that really they're both neo-Ricardians. And, uh, 
And so we come, you know, with all these uh, controversies or controversies, whatever you like, uh, what is it really about? What is really at stake? And I say that really it's the nature of the economic process itself that is, that is at stake. And also, what about, what is the scope of economics? Should we talk about organization of production or does that really go beyond what we, uh, the purview of economics? Um, Hayek... Hayek needs, you'll find out in your uh, 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 remaining seminars, that Hayek develops a uh, macroeconomic theory, a theory of business cycles that relies on an understanding of capital theory. Uh, he finds to his, uh, to his horror, well, or to his uh, shock, really, that Keynes doesn't know capital theory. So, and Keynes then admits it. So, in a, some sense, these guys end up talking across purposes. And the Keynes-Hayek debate is uh, well known and there's some disagreement sort of uh, interpretation as to who got the better and so on. But by the time the general theory comes along, that is all moot. And Hayek, I think, is left profoundly unsatisfied, to some extent feels much of what we feel today, uh, with the state of thinking about economics in the world. And... Uh, he, he embarks on a work that, that, by his own admission, exhausts him. You know, you've got to wonder why <coughs> Bruce Caldwell will be at the seminar. <coughs> I'm not sure if I'll still be here. But maybe you'll, you'll ask him, because he's one of the world's experts, foremost experts on Hayek. Ask him why uh, Hayek decides to write a book on capital, uh, you know, uh, at the, in the late 1930s. That takes him about six years. That he finishes only in 1941. That's, uh, that sort of really has no influence whatsoever and turns out to be perhaps his most difficult work. Uh, and I think the answer is, you can ask Bruce what he thinks, I think the answer is he really felt that he needed to explain to the world what Keynes didn't understand. And so he decides he wants to do it in two volumes and the first volume is this equilibrium laying out of capital theory. Very difficult to read and by the time you get to the last third of the book he abandons the process, he abandons the project and basically raises the level of, of abstraction and addresses Keynes more directly and, uh, because he knows he's never going to get to the second volume of dynamic capital theory. And I think at, at that point really he answers Keynes but it's too late. So he also in the 1930s he's writing a series of articles about capital theory that ultimately, you know, he uses in the, in the pure theory of capital. And uh, you can see if you read the pure theory of capital that he's, he's really, his concern is what we, call, what, what we might call with the composition of capital. That is, in Lachman's terminology, he's a composite. He's a composite. Uh, uh, he's in the composite. What's the word I want? School, yes. Uh, he's uh, concerned with composition rather than with, with uh, quantity, with structure rather than quantity, although the pure theory uh, sort of moves away from that. And Lachman picks up his ideas, particularly an article, Investment That Raises the Demand for Capital, uh, of, of Hayek's, and, and, and Lachman writes his capital theory in a series of articles in the 1940s that is, uh, culminates in the publication of his book, in 1956, Capital and Its Structure. Well, I have run out of time. Uh, perhaps, uh, sorry? I will just uh, tell you that uh, what Lachman, uh, it's worth uh, reading about Lachman's uh, uh, capital theory. What you have in Lachman is a series of assertions, logical assertions about the way the world works, in particular about how the way the, way the world of production works. Uh, that, that sort of culminates sort of, sort of in, a, in, a, in a complete picture of this world, of these different heterogeneous a assets that are complementary and substitutable, and some implications of that, but not a lot of implications. That it's only in this generation, finally, that we get to a, um, a realization of maybe some of the applications of Lachman's theory, and that is in the theory of management, in the theory of entrepreneurship and other related theories. Um, the theory of interest, I will summarize the Austrian theory of interest in two minutes. Uh, the first thing to note is that, the, that uh, what determines 
interest in the real world is what the Austrians call time preference. That is to say that they have a preference for things sooner rather than later. There is a controversy, there's an ambiguity in Austrian theory about what time preference means or where it comes from. Uh, I contend that it comes from the way we experience time. You will hear from Mario Rizzo uh, about time in economics and in particular the relationship between time and uncertainty. Some Misesian approaches seem to suggest that you can derive time preference from a world without uncertainty. I don't see how that's possible and I've uh, written on that and it's available on my website. But whatever determines time preference, we are agreed that time preference is both a necessary and a sufficient condition for interest. Does that mean that productivity plays no part in the determination of, of, of interest? No. But it does mean that, uh, that it's not the traditional role that is sort of portrayed in neoclassical economics. In particular, productive capital items tend to incorporate the value of their productivity in their price. So interest is a return to waiting. Interest is a return to is the price of credit. What it is not is profit. The, and to understand that, you have to understand the Austrian theory of rent, the exponent of which is Frank Fedder, not a known Austrian, but American economist who really articulated Bombavik's, the implications of Bombavik for rent. And what is rent? Rent is the price of a resource in Austrian economics. It's not a surplus earned over a cost of production or cost of reproduction, as in Ricardo. Rent, like like wages is the rent on human capital. A machine, what, a, what, a, what you would pay to rent a machine is its rental rate. If you own the machine, you pay the rent to yourself. La the rent on land is no different from the rent on anything else. It's important to understand that if you want to understand how interest is justified and the distinction between interest and profit. I'm sorry I had to rush at the end. Let me pause and, and take some questions in the uh, 10 minutes that we have available. Yeah. At least from what I've uh, read of Lachman and his um, kind of how he treats expectations, do you think, um, I guess, his colliding view of uh, economics is derived more from his view of expectations, or is it, or is the rest more in uh, other places in his uh, theory of capital and structure? I'm asked this a lot. I don't know if you heard the question. Uh, Lachman is, uh, is known within Austrian circles. Uh, uh, to have proposed, uh, you know, uh, dwelt upon the notion of a kaleidic world, a world in which things are changing much like the picture in a kaleidoscope in an unpredictable and essentially unpredictable way. Um, one might say almost chaotic way in the modern meaning of that term. And, uh, and, 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 and what about that? Uh, I, I was wondering if that was linked more directly to his uh, view on expectations. If that's linked to his view on expectations rather than his view on capital? Uh, well... I guess kind of a role that expectations play in the capital. Okay, uh, actually, l let, me, let me say this. Um, in truth, Lachman, uh, who was my, my esteemed teacher, uh, whom I have uh, yield to no one in my admiration uh, uh, for, um, he, he was, I think, when, uh, when all is said and done, made what contributions, made only one substantive contribution to economics, and that was in capital theory. I mean, he wrote a lot about other things, but he really dwelt on capital theory, and he was pretty much finished with that uh, when he published in 1956, and, and, and by that stage, people weren't interested. There is the book that he published in the 1980s, uh, Expectations in the Market Process, which, which re and he revisited capital. So the, the question is then, uh, you know, how does that relate to some of the, the perception of him in expectations in capital theory? But I think the truth is, is really quite simple. I, I don't think these are two distinct Lachmans or two distinct uh, perspectives. If you read Capital and a Structure, you see his theory of expectations is clearly laid out there. So, uh, and the theory of exp expectations derives right out of the theory of capital. Because he sees the theory of capital, thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about this that I didn't cover. <laughs> because uh, his vision of capital is one in which capital valuation is a matter of expectations. He says, capital is capital. A capital good is capital, but not by virtue of its form, but by virtue of its function. 
So you can have two, two capital goods that look completely different. If they perform the same function and produce a, uh, of, uh, something of exactly the same value, they will be valued the same. And, 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 and it's the expectations of what they can produce that really uh, is important. I and mean, it's these entrepreneurial expectations that are pitted one against the other that, const that, uh, that uh, constitutes the market process. There is no difference. And no, he is not a nihilist. Because he perceives order in the world much as Menger did. He's a Mengarian. And, uh, and he dwelt on expectations a lot. He said that the Austrians had gone a long way towards developing the subjectivism of value and needed to go further in developing the subjectivism of expectations. And so maybe, and he said you cannot predict. What he really meant is you cannot predict everything correctly. So I've dealt with this idea of nihilism, by the way, in the first part of my book and provided my own sort of uh, reconciliation, which a number of eclectic Austrians seem to have accepted. Yeah? And uh, with Gittinger's, you're talking, you talked about capital as being just physical goods. Didn't Lachman also talk about ideas or concepts? Uh, like, for, for instance, a certain methodology of producing something that you had to think of as also being capital and goods? Not to my knowledge. Uh, um, yes, at one point, like uh, patents and things like that, he recognizes. But he, 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 he fell short of recognizing human capital. Uh, I'm not sure any Austrian did. And there's no reason why Austrians should not understand human capital as capital. Absolutely not. It's implicit in Menger, it's implicit in Lachmann, it's implicit everywhere. Lachmann makes uh, an assertion at one point where he says, capital is homogeneous, but labor is not. Heterogeneous, but labor is not. That in, a way that, in a way that labor is not. Sort of, he had this vision that somehow labor is more commensurate one to the other, which is entirely untrue, particularly for the modern world. So uh, I'm not sure he got all the way there. Yeah? Um, I've heard about this famous quote that basically... You've heard about what? This famous quote in which Menger criticizes both Bauer and Capital. Yes. Your interpretation of what was Menger criticizing? You have to ask uh, Bruce Caldwell about that, but... Uh, I've n that has never been, there's no source for that. That was, that's in the air. I, I see how they have five minutes, yeah. That's, a, that's in the air, and it's, I, it's never been, um, how can I say, historically uh, substantiated. But uh, it, it seems to be true, and you can see why. Because uh, uh, Menger really uh, could have been horrified at the formulation of the average period of production. It really opens the door to Ricardo, who was the the, uh, I won't use the metaphor. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes? There's this idea of uh, inter intervening earlier. Yes. Um, as if time is sort of inextricably linked to the process. And I guess um, it seems to me that it at least has like a more contingent role than that makes it sound. Like a different way of intervening might allow the same Yes. So. Absolutely. Von Bavrek, I mean, that's one of the things that his critics misunderstood, although he made it very, very clear. He, see, he's not removing the human agency. It's not automatic. Uh, you have to choose methods of production, which, by the way, then is you have to organize production, right? So uh, he talks about well-chosen. And uh, he's also implicit in that is that you may make mistakes. No, you will make mistakes. There's some implicit experimentation going on. two people with two different ideas, and like in the same period of time, it's much faster than the results. Absolutely. So it's not, it's time per se that figures the, the value, it's, it's, the, it's the quality of the idea. Time per se is, time per se is a myth in the, in the technical term, in the technical meaning of that word. It said, and uh, uh, Mario Rizzo will talk to you about this, is that, and this Lachman emphasized of course a lot, is that uh, time, uh, as an ex is analogous to an extension of space, is a false analogy, right? So in that sense, you're absolutely right. It's, and this is what Lachman really was mostly about. It's time as we experience it. And he said, we cannot envisage time passing without the accrual of new knowledge, without accumulating new knowledge. Uh, and uh, some people are going to be right, and some people are going to be wrong when judged in retrospect. So there is no logical or systematic tendency 
as Hayek sort of asserted, for ideas to become more congruent. Except in some respects, which is what I talk about in, in my book in the first instance, there are some processes that are convergent, like the belief that the world is round. For a long time there were disparate beliefs about that, but that tended to converge because there was a, a negative feedback to wrong ideas. But in the world of commerce, there is no such negative feedback in general, because things are changing all the time. Yeah? The theory of imputation? Yeah. There is no unambiguous way to impute value to capital. That's how you reconcile it. Yeah. Uh, you know, Visa tried... Yeah, it has to be done. It has to be done. Because you have to make decisions in the firm. So you have to make a judgment about whether a machine is better used there or there. Or sold for this price or that price. It has to be done. And it can only be done in a market economy which relates to Mises' social, socialist calculation. can be done, and I also have an article on this, and, uh, I think there's a link on my, on my webpage, uh, about how a firm exists within the institutional context of a market economy, and is able to use the prices of the products, and maybe prices of substitutable and complementary um, capital items, as given from the market. Now you may say, well, how does the market develop these prices? It's turtles all the way down, right? Um, uh, somebody's making a guess, yes. And, uh, and there's this process. Yeah. There's no unambiguous way to impute value. I have one more. One more question. Back Where? Back. Just answer. I can't see you, but ask the question. Oh, okay, go ahead. That savings entails economic growth? Uh, almost always, but not always. In two senses. Number one, there are a rare occasions where you can make serendipitous discoveries without any prior effort. And there are some cases where savings can be wasted. So almost always. All right, thanks very much.